Welcome, everyone. My name is Stacy Davidson, and I'm a co-founder and the first president of the Missouri chapter of the American Research Center in Egypt, also called RC Missouri. Welcome to the educational activities slash lesson plans section of our symposium, Mo Egypt 5. Each presenter will speak for around 15 minutes, and then there will be time for a five minute Q&A after each presenter. Please type your questions into the Q&A box. You can find that on your Zoom task panel. So please welcome our first presenter, Dr. Jennifer Miyuki Babcock, on a topic of great interest to me as a community college professor, teaching ancient Egypt in community college, reframing and rethinking the field. Thank you so much, Stacy, for that introduction. And uh, I also like to thank RC Mo for organizing such a great uh, symposium. I think this is fantastic. And one of the ways where we can um, not just talk about you know, reframing the field and thinking about how to um, present Egyptology to the public, but but being active in that. Um, so I'm going to start by just mentioning that the 13th Congress of the International Association of Egyptologists took place in light in the summer. And the theme of that conference was the future of Egyptology. Uh, and this is a broad topic and that one can approach from many angles. So we had some talks that covered new technologies, the digital humanities, um, and also fresh approaches to the, to the field, such as archaeo gaming. Um, there are also talks that renewed some longstanding discussions related to cultural repatriation and restitution. In addition to the talks, there were also workshops and panels that covered various aspects of where Egyptology was going or what Egyptology had to do to keep up with other fields in the humanities. So today, what I'm going to do is share many of the ideas that I presented at this conference um, and in my own talk and also in the in the workshops and panels that I participated in today. Um, and one thing I also want to give RC Mo credit for is making this pan, uh, this whole symposium incredibly accessible. Uh, one thing about the International Association of Egyptologists is that although it's a great conference, it can be very expensive. Um, and so in that way, it's very limiting to who can have access to um, the information and ideas that are being spread. So last year, I casually surveyed my students um, enrolled in my Egyptology classes at the Fashion Institute of Technology, who are mostly taking my class to fulfill elective requirements. And the survey that I gave them posed the following questions. Do you know anything about, did you know anything about Egyptology before taking this course? Did you ever consider Egyptology as a viable or possible career choice? Why or why not? If you wanted to pursue Egyptology, do you think it would be possible to do so? Why or why not? What changes would you like to see in Egyptology or in academia and education in general that would allow for more opportunities for underrepresented, uh, underrepresented populations. And then finally, feel free to add any additional questions that are not addressed in the above questions. So the um, approach to these, the answers to these questions is not one that is easily quantitative, but the responses gave me a glimpse into the mindset of my students. Most students were familiar with what Egyptology is, um, that their knowledge usually came from popular culture, such as the representation of ancient Egypt or Egyptologists in TV and film. And maybe because of that, not a single person had ever considered Egyptology as a viable career choice. Um, which is why most students uh, responded that they did not want to or ever even considered pursuing a degree in Egyptology. Overall, my students felt that Egyptology and also academia in general were inaccessible and primarily for a privileged minority. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the Egyptology State of the Field project, um, which is run by some people who are here. Uh, so to those who might be unfamiliar with it though, this is a volunteer run collaborative project. Um, again, organized by many of my American colleagues. I am not an organizer of this project, but I have participated in surveys uh, that gather demographic information um, about race, gender, sexuality, and income 
from those who have obtained advanced degrees in Egyptology and who are working as Egyptologists or in Egyptology adjacent fields in the USA. So their data has not been published yet, but you can find some of their presentations given at RC and ASOR meetings on their website. You can find the link there. Um, survey responses so far show that at least American Egyptology suffers from an overall lack of diversity. For instance, most American Egyptologists are white and identify as heterosexual. Furthermore, those with stable teaching positions identify as male rather than female, which is interesting given that most Egyptologists taking this survey self-identified as female. <clears throat> now, FIT student body is not representative of who we find typically enrolled in Egyptological programs or who end up with Egyptological or Egyptologically adjacent careers in the US. At FIT, half our students identify with an ethnicity other than white, and most students self-identify as female, though this chart does not take into consideration students who are gender non-conforming, which at FIT is a growing population. Within Egyptology, these students would be minorities based on gender and race alone, but there are other aspects of these students' backgrounds that would make it far less likely that they would ever become involved in Egyptology or Egyptology adjacent fields. Now the Egyptology State of the Field project has not yet collected data related to the socioeconomic backgrounds of the survey participants and where they earn their advanced degrees. But a quick look at curricula offered in American universities shows that courses related specifically to Egyptology are not typically offered. And when they are, they are mostly at elite, expensive private schools. And we do have public institutions of higher learning that offer courses in Egyptology like UCLA, Berkeley, and the universities of Michigan and Memphis. These are less expensive, but not necessarily affordable. And they're also intensely competitive to get into. So they might not necessarily be in reach for many people, particularly to those who come from families where education and especially higher education is not a priority nor expected. But even if a quote, unlikely student ultimately ends at one of the schools that offer Egyptology or Egyptology adjacent courses, how many students would think about Egyptology as a viable career option if they would even think about it at all? So the lack of diversity and equity in this field can be translated as a lack of opportunity and access to many. So FIT offers graduate level classes and bachelor's level classes. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold. But historically it is a trade school and it's dedicated to fashion and apparel. And this means many students who attend FIT may not necessarily pursue a bachelor's degree or higher. So technically FIT is a junior college or a community college, and that most students are there to pursue two years associate degrees. So to explain to anyone who may not be familiar what, with what a junior college is, um, basically they provide preparation for a bachelor's degree, or the education you receive there may be considered a qualification for employment opportunities down the line. Most competitive undergraduate college programs in the US do not offer two-year associate degrees. They're only granting bachelor's degrees or higher. So high school, <coughs> high school students who want to pursue at least a bachelor's degree may choose to directly go to a four-year program after graduation but there's also many who may opt to enroll in a two-year program first. And one major reason to do that is cost. So two, people enrolled in two-year programs, for instance, they're often commuting locally, so they don't have to pay for university housing. Also the cost for each class unit at a community or junior college is more affordable um, than even for public four-year colleges. While attending a two-year program, students can fulfill general education requirements, 
as well as take some elective courses that will allow them to graduate with their bachelor's degrees more quickly at a lower cost. Unfortunately for many two-year programs, the types of courses offered tend to not be as varied because of the fact that they're primarily designed to fulfill these general education requirements for four-year programs. Specialized classes like Egyptology are typically not offered because the credits attached to these classes would not be readily transferable to most majors or degree requirements. Egyptology is also not typically associated with employment, sorry to say, or for providing hard skills or quote, useful knowledge that could be applied laterally outside of academia. <laughs> Before I came to FIT's history of art department, there were only two classes that covered ancient Egyptian culture, cities and civilizations, the Eastern Mediterranean world, circa 3000 BCE to 1000 CE, and history of Western art one, which is a survey course that spans from prehistoric art to the European Middle Ages or circa 1400. Both classes are considered electives that could fulfill potential general education requirements. However, students usually take modern art or history of Western art too instead, because many of them at FIT feel that it is more relevant to their work as future illustrators, fashion designers, and graphic designers. History of Western R2 has a higher enrollment and more sections offered per semester than history of Western R1 because the curriculum is structured in a way where it is the prerequisite course for many of the other classes in the department. So you can compare this slide to what I just showed you here so we can really see the difference. So as a result, many students may attend FIT without ever learning about the ancient world and may implicitly adopt or hold on to the belief that the past is in the past and has no relevance to their present or their future. But I knew from talking to my students and talking to colleagues that there was an interest in ancient world art history, even if it's implied through the curriculum structure that it's irrelevant. So in 2019, I wrote an ancient Egyptian art survey course. The class was filled immediately. And for the last three years, it has been consistently waitlisted. And I eventually learned that students were not only interested in learning about pyramids and the coffins that they used to visit at the Met and the Brooklyn Museum as kids, but they were also fascinated with my background and wanted to know more about what Egyptology was. And more importantly, what is it that Egyptology, uh, Egyptologists do? On top of teaching and developing classes to meet these demands, I have also helped develop events and programming at FIT with my colleague, Alex Nagel, an archeologist and art historian who focuses on ancient Persia. The events we organize not only provide a stage for ancient world studies at FIT, but also garner new interest and discussion around the ancient world on our campus. Our first event, Repositioning Egyptologies, was in a sense one of FIT's contributions to larger Black Lives Matter discussions that people were having in the United States after George Floyd's murder in May, 2020. Our invited speakers, Solange Ashby, Elizabeth Minor, Lisa Saladino Haney, and Vanessa Davies spoke about topics that circled heavily around systemic racism and colonialism. A major point of ref reflection in this event was how systemic racism and colonialism have shaped the field of Egyptology and also other academic fields born in the European tradition, but how this is rarely addressed in the classroom with our students. As I mentioned before, many of our, our students at FIT are considered minorities and educating them about the current state of art history and Egyptology is a way that they can better understand the systemic ways that they could be or might be excluded from dialogues and decision-making today. Thus, this historiography is 100% relevant to their current lives and futures, which is why I developed my repositioning Ancient Egypt and Rethinking Egyptology class in spring 2021. One of the course goals is to have students think about 
how Egyptology and academia more broadly can be more exclusive, inclusive, excuse me, and break away from its problematic foundations. Even before my students enroll in my class, I subliminally ask them to think about race vis-a-vis -vis our understanding of the ancient Egyptians through the advertisement I designed for the course. The most noticeable part of this flyer is the photograph of Beyonce as Nefertiti, or at least of Beyonce placing Nefertiti's crown on her head. One could interpret this image as Beyonce claiming ancient Egypt for Black America, a varied population, but one which had a major role in the Pan-African movement. Uh, the photograph of Beyonce is also superimposed on a photograph of the original ancient Nefertiti bust. And students who end up enrolled in my class eventually learn about the Nefertiti bus connection to Hitler and his desire to use it as the centerpiece of his museum, celebrating the triumph of white Aryan culture. At this point in the class, we talk about how their understanding of the ad may have changed from when they had first seen it in the halls of FIT before enrolling in the course. Students are asked to reflect on the ways that ancient Egyptian iconography, as well as ancient Egyptian identity has been used and claimed by various people and populations with different end goals in mind. At the start of the semester, repositioning ancient Egypt and rethinking Egyptology explains how and why ancient Egypt became associated with European culture or more broadly, the great white race as defined by Breasted. We also talk about African-centered scholars such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Leo Hansberry, and Sheikh Anta Diop, who challenge traditional views of Egyptology and who have argued for looking at Egypt not only as an African culture, but also as a Black African culture. And comparing traditional Egyptology with African-centered Egyptology we think about how academic arguments might be shaped by one's experiences and biases and how the reception or rejection of these arguments is also similarly affected by one's experiences and biases. Students observe that anti-Black pro-white ideas were accepted and perpetuated for a longer period than the scholarship of Black Egyptologists which who, who have been ignored, dismissed and obscured. So for my students who identify with groups who have faced prejudices in the US and elsewhere, this observation was sadly unsurprising. This class is challenging for my students on intellectual and also personal levels. Many of our discussions are based around what race and ethnicity are, which is already difficult, but perhaps even more so for many of my students who identify as ethnically or racially mixed. And assessing how race and ethnicity were defined in ancient Egypt poses additional hurdles. I give my students opportunities to read translated texts and study images so that they can better grasp how the ancient Egyptians understood themselves and their relations to other cultures. Students are Babcock, apologies. We are running out of time. So if you'd like to finish up with maybe a minute or two, we may or may not have time for QA. <laughs> okay, so yeah, sorry about that. So um Basically, it's, it's, sorry, I lost my sort of place here, but um, the idea is that there's this official narrative about, you know, race and ethnicity, and then there's like the real lived experience of race and um, ethnicity in ancient Egypt. I also wanted to say that I incorporate the scholarship of Egyptian Egyptologists as much as I can. So last year I invited Monica Hanna, this, the conference's uh, keynote speaker, the ICE's keynote speaker, to give a presentation. Um, and this is something that we should do in general. Modern technology allows us to not have any excuses to exclude Egyptian perspectives. So if the field is serious about decolonization and providing a platform for Egyptian scholarship and for everybody, then we should do that. You know, we're in an interconnected world and global, and so we can't be gatekeepers. And we should be open to training and educating artists, UX designers, programmers, content creators, 
in addition to academics, scholars, and curators. We need to diversify the field so that everyone has um, a chance to participate in this conversation. Um, and so I hope that with this course, my students are able to know the answer to what do Egyptologists actually do. And I hope that they see too, that they are able to be part of this conversation as well. And at this point, I did end the conversation in Leiden, but in the Q&A in Leiden, somebody asked me what I thought about the Kemet exhibition, which was a little uncomfortable because it was an intensely controversial exhibition. Um, so Egypt had revoked the museum's excavation permits, citing that the exhibition, which highlighted black musicians inspired by ancient Egypt as falsifying history. Um, and my response is basically that I don't feel like this exhibit is different from any other exhibition focused on Egyptomania. The reception of ancient Egypt is an aspect of Egyptology and illustrating black um, interpretations of Egypt is equally valid as the white um, interpretations. So when we bridge and connect ancient Egypt to today's audiences, I really do mean all of today's audiences. So uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, if you want to email me and, and you know, sh I can share my, uh, my course syllabus with you as well. And uh, thank you so much for listening.